Hello, everyone. I'm John Horrigan, and thank you for joining me on Journey Through the Past. In this edition, The Life and Legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King. Thank you for watching the Waltham Channel, WCAC-TV Community Access. The views and opinions expressed on WCAC-TV are those of the author, John Horrigan, and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of WCAC-TV or MAC-TV. Any content that I provide is of my own personal opinion and is not intended to malign any religion, ethnic group, club, organization, company, individual, or anyone or anything. One of the greatest speakers and leaders of our time, Dr. Martin Luther King. Now let's look at his life. Now, Martin Luther King was born January 15, 1929, in Atlanta, Georgia, to the Reverend Martin Luther King Sr., who passed in 1984, and Alberta Williams King, who passed in 1974. Now, King's legal name at birth was Michael King, and his father was also born Michael King, but the elder King changed his and his son's names following a 1934 trip to Germany to attend the Fifth Baptist World Alliance Congress in Berlin. Now, it was during this time he chose to be called Martin Luther King in honor of the German reformer Martin Luther. And King had Irish ancestry through his paternal great-grandfather as well as African ancestry. King was a middle child between an older sister, Willie Christine King, and a younger brother, Alfred Daniel Williams. And he sang with his church choir at the 1939 Atlanta premiere of the movie Gone with the Wind. Martin liked singing and music. And his mother was an accomplished organist and choir leader, and she took him to various churches to sing. He received attention for singing, I want to be more and more like Jesus, and later became a member of the junior choir in his church. Now, King said that his father regularly whipped him until he was 15. In fact, a neighbor reported hearing the elder King telling the son, quote, he would make something out of him even if he had to beat him to death. Now, King saw his father's proud and fearless protests against segregation, such as King Sr. refusing to listen to a traffic policeman after being referred to as boy, or stalking out of a store with his son when being told by a shoe clerk that they would have to move to the rear of the store in order to be served. Now, when King was a child, he befriended a white boy whose father owned a business near his family's home. And when the boys were six, they started school. King had to attend a school for African Americans, and the other boy went to one for whites because public schools were among the facilities segregated by state law. King lost his friend because the white child's father no longer wanted the boys to play together. Now, Martin suffered from depression throughout much of his life. In his adolescent years, he initially felt resentment against whites due to the racial humiliation that he, his family, and his neighbors often had to endure in the segregated South. At the age of 12, shortly after his maternal grandmother died, King blamed himself, and he jumped out of a second-story window, but survived. Now, King was skeptical of many of Christianity's claims. At the age of 13, he denied the bodily resurrection of Jesus during Sunday school. From this point, he stated, that doubts began to spring forth unrelentingly. However, he later concluded that the Bible has many profound truths which one cannot escape, and he decided to enter the seminary. Now, growing up in Atlanta, Martin attended Booker T. Washington High School, and he became known for his public speaking ability, and he was part of the school's debate team. And he would become the youngest assistant manager of a newspaper delivery station for the Atlanta Journal in 1942, and he was only 13. Now, during his junior year, he won first prize in an oratorical contest sponsored by the Negro Elks Club in Dublin, Georgia. But returning home to Atlanta by bus, he and his teacher were ordered by the driver to stand so that white passengers could sit down. Now, King initially refused, but he complied after his teacher told him that he would be breaking the law if he did not submit. And King said that during this incident, he was the angriest I have ever been in my life. A precocious student, he skipped both the ninth and 12th grades of high school. Now, during King's junior year in high school, Morehouse College, a respected historically black college, announced that it would accept any high school juniors who could pass its entrance exam. At that time, many students had abandoned further studies to enlist in World War II. But due to this, Morehouse was eager to fill its classrooms. At the age of 15, Martin Luther King passed the exam and entered Morehouse College. 
The summer before his last year at Morehouse in 1947, the 18-year-old King chose to enter the ministry. He had concluded that the church offered the most assuring way to answer an inner urge to serve humanity. The King's inner urge had begun developing, and he made peace with the Baptist church, as he believed he would be a rational minister with sermons that were a respectful force for ideas, even social protest. In 1948, he graduated from Morehouse with a BA degree in sociology, and he enrolled in Crozier Theological Seminary in Chester, Pennsylvania, from which he graduated in 1951. His father fully supported his decision to continue his education. While attending Crozier, King was joined by Walter McCall, a former classmate at Morehouse. And at Crozier, King was elected president of the student body. The African-American students of Crozier, for the most part, conducted their social activity on Edward Street. King became fond of the street because a classmate had an aunt who prepared collard greens for them, which they both relished. Now, King once reproved another student for keeping beer in his room, saying that they had shared responsibility as African-Americans to, quote, bear the burdens of the Negro race. For a time, he was interested in Walter Rauschenbusch's social gospel. In his third year at Morehouse, King became romantically involved with the white daughter of an immigrant German woman who worked as a cook in the school's cafeteria. The daughter had been involved with the professor prior to her relationship with Martin, and Martin planned to marry her, but friends advised against it, saying that such an interracial marriage would provoke animosity from both blacks and whites, potentially damaging his chances of ever pastoring a church in the South. King tearfully told a friend that he could not endure his mother's pain over the marriage, and he broke the relationship off six months later. He continued to have lingering feelings towards the woman he left. One friend was quoted as saying he never recovered. King married Coretta Scott on June 18, 1953, on the lawn of her parents' house in her hometown of Highburger, Alabama. He was 24, and she was 26. And they had four children together, Yolanda King, born 1955, Martin Luther King III, born 1957, Dexter Scott King, born 1961, and Bernice King, born 1963. Now, during their marriage, King limited Coretta's role in the civil rights movement, expecting her to be a housewife and mother. At age 25 in 1954, King was called as pastor of the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama. King began doctoral studies in systematic theology at Boston University, and he received his Ph.D. degree on June 5, 1955, with a dissertation on a comparison of the conceptions of God and the thinking of Paul Tillich and Henry Nelson Wyman. Now, while pursuing doctoral studies, King worked as an assistant minister at Boston's historic 12th Baptist Church with Reverend William Hunter Hester, who was an old friend of Martin's father, and he became an important influence on King. Decades later, an academic inquiry in October of 1991 concluded that portions of his dissertation had been plagiarized and he had acted improperly. However, despite its finding, the committee said that no thought should be given to the revocation of Dr. King's doctoral degree, an action that the panel said would serve no purpose. The committee also found that the dissertation still makes an intelligent contribution to scholarship. A letter is now attached to the copy of King's dissertation, now held in the university library, noting that numerous passages were included without the appropriate quotations and citations of sources. In March of 1955, a 15-year-old schoolgirl in Montgomery, Alabama, Claudette Colvin, refused to give up her bus seat to a white man in compliance with Jim Crow laws, local regulations, and the southern United States that enforced racial segregation. Now, King was on the committee from the Birmingham African-American community that looked into the case, but because Colvin was pregnant and unmarried, E.D. Nixon and Clifford Durr, pictured here, decided to wait for a better case to pursue. And that came on December 1st, 1955, Rosa Parks was arrested for refusing to give up her seat. She remained seated to stand for her civil rights. And the Montgomery bus boycott, urged and planned by Nixon and led by King, soon followed. The boycott would last for 385 days, and the situation became so tense that Martin's house was bombed. 
King was arrested during this campaign, which concluded with the U.S. District Court ruling in Browder versus Gale that ended racial segregation on all Montgomery public buses. King's role in the bus boycott transformed him into a national figure and the best-known spokesman of the civil rights movement. In 1957, King, Ralph Abernathy, Fred Shuttlesworth, Joseph Lowry, and other civil rights activists founded the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, or the SCLC. Now, the group was created to harness the moral authority and organizing power of black churches to conduct nonviolent protests in the service of civil rights reform. One of the group's inspirations were the crusades of evangelist Billy Graham, who befriended King after he attended the Graham Crusade in New York City in 1957. King led the SCLC until his death. Now, the SCLC's 1957 Prayer Pilgrimage for Freedom was the first time Martin addressed a national audience. Other civil rights leaders involved in the SCLC with King included James Bevel, Alan Johnson, Curtis W. Harris, Walter E. Fontroy, C.T. Vivian, Andrew Young, the Freedom Singers, Charles Evers, Cleveland Robinson, Randolph Blackwell, Annie Bell Robinson Devine, Charles Kenzie Steele, Alfred Daniel Williams King, Benjamin Hooks, Aaron Henry, and Bayard Rustin. On September 20th, 1958, while signing copies of his book, Stride Toward Freedom, in Bloomstein's department store in Harlem, New York, King narrowly escaped death when Isola Curry, a mentally ill African-American woman who believed he was conspiring against her with communists, stabbed him in the chest with a letter opener. And after emergency surgery, King was hospitalized for several weeks, while Curry was found mentally incompetent to stand trial. Now, in 1959, he published a short book called The Measure of a Man, which contained his sermons, What is Man? and The Dimensions of a Complete Life. The sermons argued for man's need for God's love and criticized the racial injustices of Western civilization. Now, the Gandhi Society for Human Rights was a fund founded by leaders of the nonviolent civil rights movement, and King served as honorary president for the group. Quote, in the struggle for human rights and justice, Negroes will make a mistake if they become bitter and indulge in hate campaigns. Now, displeased with the pace of President John Kennedy's addressing the issue of segregation, King and the Gandhi Society produced a document in 1962 calling on the president to follow in the footsteps of Abraham Lincoln and use an executive order to deliver a blow for civil rights as a kind of second emancipation proclamation. The FBI, under a written directive from Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy, began tapping King's telephone in the fall of 1963. Concerned that allegations of communists in the SCLC, if made public, would derail the administration's civil rights initiatives, Kennedy warned King to discontinue the suspect associations and later felt compelled to issue the directive authorizing the FBI to wiretap King and other SCLC leaders. This man, I always cringe when I see his photo, J. Edgar Hoover, feared that communists were trying to infiltrate the civil rights movement. But when no such evidence emerged, the Bureau used the incidental details caught on tape over the next five years in attempts to force King out of the preeminent leadership position. Blackmail. Now, King believed that the organized nonviolent protest against the system of Southern segregation known as Jim Crow laws would lead to extensive media coverage of the struggle for black equality and voting rights. Now, journalistic accounts and televised footage of the daily deprivation and indignities suffered by Southern blacks and of segregationist violence and harassment of civil rights workers and marchers produced a wave of sympathetic public opinion that convinced the majority of Americans that the civil rights movement was the most important issue in American politics in the early 1960s. King organized and led marches for blacks' rights to vote, desegregation, labor rights, and other basic civil rights. Most of these rights were successfully enacted into the law of the United States with the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the 1965 Voting Rights Act, passed by the administration of Lyndon Johnson, but the foundations were formed by the Kennedy administration. 
Now, King and the SELC put into practice many of the principles of the Christian left and applied the tactics of nonviolent protest with great success by strategically choosing the method of protest and the places in which protests were carried out. There were often dramatic standoffs with segregationist authorities, and sometimes these confrontations turned violent. Throughout his participation in the civil rights movement, King was criticized by many groups, which included opposition by more militant blacks, such as Nation of Islam member Malcolm X, separatist Stokely Carmichael, and Omali Yeshitila. The Albany Movement was a desegregation coalition formed in Albany, Georgia in November of 1961, and a month later, the SCLC became involved. The movement mobilized thousands of citizens for a broad-front, nonviolent attack on every aspect of segregation within the city, and it attracted nationwide attention. Now, when King first visited on December 15, 1961, he had, quote, planned to stay a day or so and return home after giving counsel. The following day, however, December 16th, he was swept up in a mass arrest of peaceful demonstrators, and he declined bail until the city made concessions. According to Martin, that agreement was dishonored and violated by the city after he left the town. King returned in July of 1962, and he was sentenced to 45 days in jail or a $178 fine, but he chose jail. And three days into his sentence, police chief Laurie Pritchett discreetly arranged for King's fine to be paid and ordered his release. Quote, Martin said, we had witnessed persons being kicked off lunch counter stools, ejected from churches, and thrown into jail. But for the first time, we witnessed being kicked out of jail. It was later acknowledged by the King Center that Billy Graham was the one who bailed King out of jail during this time. Now, after nearly a year of intense activism with few tangible results, the movement began to deteriorate. King requested a halt to all demonstrations and a day of penance to promote nonviolence and maintain the moral high ground. Divisions within the black community and the canny low-key response by local governments defeated efforts. Though the Albany effort proved a key lesson in tactics for King and the national civil rights movement, the national media was highly critical of King's role in the defeat and the SCLC's lack of results. After Albany, King sought to choose engagements for the SCLC in which he could control the circumstances rather than entering into pre-existing situations. In April of 1963, the SCLC began a campaign against racial segregation and economic injustice in Birmingham, Alabama. The campaign used nonviolent but intentionally confrontational tactics, and black people in Birmingham, organizing with the SCLC, occupied public spaces with marches and sit-ins, openly violating laws that they considered unjust. Now, King's intent was to provoke mass arrests and create a situation so crises packed that it will inevitably open the door to negotiation. However, the campaign's early volunteers did not succeed in shutting down the city or in drawing media attention to the police's actions. The SCLC changed the course of the campaign then by recruiting children and young adults to join in the demonstrations. Newsweek, would call this strategy a children's crusade. Now, during the protests, the Birmingham Police Department, led by this man, Eugene Bull Connor, used high pressure water jets and police dogs against protesters, including children. Footage of the police response was broadcast on national television news and dominated the nation's attention, shocking many white Americans and consolidating black Americans behind the movement. Not all of the demonstrators were peaceful despite the avowed intentions of the SCLC. In some cases, bystanders attacked the police who responded with brute force. King and the SCLC were criticized for putting children in harm's way, but the campaign was a success. Connor lost his job, the Jim Crow signs came down, and public places became more open to blacks as King's reputation improved immensely. King was arrested and jailed early in the campaign. His 13th arrest, out of what would become 29. From his cell, he composed the now famous letter from Birmingham jail, which responded to calls on the movement to pursue legal channels for social change. King argued that the crisis of racism was too urgent and the current system was too entrenched. Quote, 
We know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. He points out that the Boston Tea Party, a celebrated act of rebellion in the American colonies, was illegal civil disobedience, and that conversely, everything Adolf Hitler did in Germany was legal. King also expressed his frustration with white moderates and clergymen. He considered them to be too timid to oppose an unjust system. In December 1964, King and the SCLC joined forces with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the SNCC, in Selma, Alabama, where the SNCC had been working on black voter registration for many months. A local judge issued an injunction that barred any gathering of three or more people affiliated with the SNCC, SCLC, or with any of 41 named civil rights leaders. This injunction temporarily halted civil rights activity until Martin defied it by speaking at Brown Chapel on January 2nd, 1965. Deep down in our nonviolent creed is the conviction that there are some things so dear, some things so precious, some things so eternally true that they're worth dying for. And if a man happens to be 36 years old as I happen to be, and some great truth stands before the door of his life. Some great opportunity to stand up for that which is right. He's afraid his home will get bombed. Or he's afraid that he will lose his job. Or he's afraid that he will get shot or beat down by state troopers. He may go on and live until he's 80. But he's just as dead as 36 as he would be at 80. And the cessation of breathing in his life is merely the belated announcement of an earlier death of the spirit. He died. dies when he refuses to stand up for that which is right. Yes. A man dies when he refuses to stand up for justice. Yes. A man dies when he refuses to take a stand for that which is true. Yes. So we're going to stand up right here amid horses. Yes. We're going to stand up right here in Alabama amid the billy clubs. We're going to stand up right here in Alabama amid police dogs if they have them. We're going to stand up amid tear gas. Yeah. We're going to stand up amid anything that they can muster up, yeah. letting the world know yeah. that we are determined to be free. King was instrumental in the organization of the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, which took place on August 28, 1963. The other leaders and organizations comprising the Big Six were Roy Wilkins from the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, Whitney Young, National Urban League, A. Philip Randolph, Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, John Lewis, SNCC, and James L. Farmer Jr. of the Congress of Racial Equality. Now, Martin is most famous for his I Have a Dream speech, which he gave in front of the Lincoln Memorial during the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Now, the march originally was conceived as an event to dramatize the desperate condition of blacks in the southern United States and an opportunity to place organizers' concerns and grievances squarely before the seat of power in the nation's capital. Organizers intended to denounce the federal government for its failure to safeguard the civil rights and physical safety of civil rights workers and black people. Now, the march did, however, make specific demands, an end to racial segregation in public schools, meaningful civil rights legislation, including a law prohibiting racial discrimination in employment, protection of civil rights workers from police brutality, a $2 minimum wage for all workers, and self-government for Washington, D.C., then governed by Congressional Committee. Despite tensions, the march was a resounding success. More than a quarter of a million people of diverse ethnicities attended the event, sprawling from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial onto the National Mall and around the reflecting pool. At the time, it was the largest gathering of protesters in the history of Washington, D.C. Now, Martin delivered a 17-minute speech, which we called the I Have a Dream speech. In the speech's most famous passage, in which he departed from his prepared text, possibly at the prompting of Mahalia Jackson, who shouted behind him, Tell them about the dream. And to think 
that he did this without a prepared text, memorized, no teleprompters. He spoke from here. I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. But 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. 100 years later, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. One hundred years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. One hundred years later, the Negro is still languid in the corners of American society and finds himself in exile in his own land. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. But we refuse to believe that the Bank of Justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity of this nation. So we've come to cash this check, a check that will give us upon demand the riches of freedom and the security of justice. We have also come to this hallowed spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. Now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of segregation to the sunlit path of racial justice. Now is the time to lift our nation from the quick sands of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. Now is the time. There are those who are asking the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. 
We cannot be satisfied as long as a Negro in Mississippi cannot vote and a Negro in New York believes he has nothing for which to vote. Satisfied, and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair. I say to you today, my friend, Even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up, live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day, down in Alabama, with its vicious racist, with its governor, having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification. One day right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted. Every hill and mountain shall be made low, the rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is the faith that I go back to the South with. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the dangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. This will be the day, this will be the day when all of God's children be able to sing with new meaning, my country tears of thee. We land of liberty of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. So let freedom ring. From the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire, let freedom ring. From the mighty mountains of New York, yes. let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the curvaceous slopes of California. Yes. But not only that, let freedom ring from Stone Mountain.
Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and mole hill of Mississippi, from every mountainside. Let freedom ring, and when this happens, when we allow freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics will be able to join hands and sing into words of the old Negro spiritual. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. I Have a Dream came to be regarded as one of the finest speeches in the history of American oratory. There's no doubting that. It was a beautiful speech. The march, and especially Martin's speech, helped put civil rights at the top of the agenda of reformers in the United States, and it facilitated the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Then came the march from Selma to Montgomery, a march to the Alabama state's capital. The first attempt to march on March 7, 1965, was aborted because of mob and police violence against the demonstrators. This day has become known as Bloody Sunday and was a major turning point in the effort to gain public support for the civil rights movement. It was the clearest demonstration up to that time of the dramatic potential of King's nonviolent strategy, even though he wasn't even present. Now, King met with officials in the Lyndon B. Johnson administration on March 5th in order to request an injunction against any prosecutions of the demonstrators. Footage of police brutality against the protesters were broadcast extensively and aroused national public outrage. Now, King next attempted to organize a march for March 9th to the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, then held a short prayer session before turning the marchers around and asking them to disperse so as not to violate the court order to disband. The unexpected ending of the second march aroused the surprise and anger of many within the local movement. The march finally went ahead fully on March 25th, 1965, and at the conclusion of the march on the steps of the state capitol, King delivered a speech that became known as, How Long? Not Long. I know you're asking today, how long will it take? Somebody's asking, how long will prejudice blind the visions of men? I come to say to you this afternoon, however difficult the moment, Yes, sir. However frustrating the hour, it will not be long no, because truth crushed earth will rise again. Yes, sir. How long, not long, yes, sir. because no lie can live forever. Yes, sir. How long, not long, yes, sir. because you shall reap what you sow. Yes, sir. How long, no. not long. Do forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne. Yes, sir. Yet that scaffold sways the future. Yes, Behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadow, keeping watch above his own. How long? Not long. Because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Yes, How long? Not, Not long. long. Because mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Yes, He's trampling out the village where the grapes of wrath are stored. Yes, sir. Yeah. He's loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. Yes, sir. His truth is marching on. Yes, sir. He has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. Yes, he is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Yes, oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. Yeah. Glory, hallelujah. Yes, Glory, hallelujah. Yes, Glory, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. This truth is marching on. In it, King stated that equal rights for African Americans could not be far away because, quote, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Now, Martin long opposed American involvement in the Vietnam War. In an April 4th, 1967 appearance at the New York City Riverside Church, exactly one year before his death, King delivered a speech titled, Beyond Vietnam, A Time to Break Silence. 
He spoke strongly against the U.S.'s role in the war, arguing that the U.S. was in Vietnam to, quote, occupy it as an American colony and calling the U.S. government the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today. Things haven't changed. I come to this magnificent house of worship tonight because my conscience leaves me no other choice. Time comes when silence is betrayal. That time has come for us in relation to Vietnam. Why are you speaking about the war, Dr. King? Why are you joining the voices of dissent? Peace and civil rights don't mix, they say. And of irony can save him when he hears the most powerful nation of the world. Speaking of aggression as it drops thousands of bombs on a poor, weak nation more than 800, or rather 8,000 miles away from its shoulders. At this point, I should make it clear that while I have tried in these last few minutes to give a voice to the voiceless in Vietnam, to understand the arguments of those who are called enemy, I am as deeply concerned about our own troops there as anything else. The Americans are forcing even their friends into becoming their enemies. The image of America will never again be the image of revolution, freedom and democracy, but the image of violence and militarism, unquote. We continue, there will be no doubt in my mind and in the mind of the world we have no honorable intentions in Vietnam. Number one, end all bombing in North and South Vietnam. Number two, declare a uni unilateral ceasefire in the hope that such action will create the atmosphere for negotiation. Three, take immediate steps to prevent other battlegrounds in Southeast Asia by curtailing our military buildup in Thailand and our interference in Laos. Four, realistically accept the fact that the National Liberation Front has substantial support in South Vietnam and must thereby play a role in any meaningful negotiations and any future Vietnam government. Five, set a date that we will remove all foreign troops from Vietnam in accordance with the 1954 Geneva Agreement. He also connected the war with economic injustice, arguing that the country needed serious moral change. Quote, a true revolution of values will soon look uneasily on the glaring contrast of poverty and wealth. With righteous indignation, it will look across the seas and see individual capitalists of the West investing huge sums of money in Asia, Africa, and South America, only to take the profits out with no concern for the social betterment of the countries and say, this is not just. On April 15, 1967, King spoke at an anti-Vietnam war march from New York's Central Park to the United Nations, where he brought up issues of civil rights and the draft. We, the participants in today's unprecedented national peace demonstration, although of many national origins, faiths, and shades of political opinion, are united in our conviction of the imperative need for an immediate peaceful solution to an illegal and unjustifiable war. We are determined that the killing be stopped and that a nuclear holocaust be avoided. We rally at the United Nations in order to reaffirm our support of the principles of peace, universality, equal rights, and self-determination of peoples embodied in the Charter and acclaimed by mankind but violated by the United States. That there has never been an advocacy on my part of a mechanical merger of the civil rights and the peace movement. I have felt, however, that the spirit of the civil rights movement uh, should certainly imbue the peace movement and thereby strengthen the uh, peace movement. Well, I hope it will arouse an awareness on the part uh, <laughs> of many, many people in our country and in arousing an awareness on the part of many people cause them uh, to take a stand in their own personal ways 
against what we consider a very unjust and unjustifiable war and a war that is terribly damaging the soul of our nation. Uh, the issues are inextricably tied together. In the final analysis, there can be no peace without justice and there can be no justice without peace. Quote, I have not urged a mechanical fusion of the civil rights and peace movements. There are people who have come to see the moral imperative of equality, but who cannot yet see the moral imperative of world brotherhood. I would like to see the fervor of the civil rights movement imbued into the peace movement to instill it with greater strength. And I believe everyone has a duty to be in both the civil rights and peace movements. But for those who presently choose but one, I would hope they will finally come to see the moral roots common to both. The importance of the hippies is not in their unconventional behavior, but in the fact that hundreds of thousands of young people, in turning to a flight from reality, are expressing a profoundly discrediting view on the society they emerge from. On January 13, 1968, the day after President Johnson's State of the Union address, King called for a large march on Washington against, quote, one of history's most cruel and senseless wars, quote, we need to make clear in this political year to congressmen on both sides of the aisle and to the president of the United States that we will no longer tolerate, we will no longer vote for men who continue to see the killings of Vietnamese and Americans as the best way of advancing the goals of freedom and self-determination in Southeast Asia. I want to make it very clear that I'm going to continue with all of my might, with all of my energy, and with all of my action to oppose that abominable, evil, unjust war in Vietnam. And I say that that is a great need now for a radical reordering of priorities in America, and that is a great need for a revolution of values. Henry David Thoreau said in his essay on civil disobedience that non-cooperation with evil is as much a moral obligation as is cooperation with good. And I do not plan to cooperate with evil at any point. And I say to you in conclusion, and I say to you in conclusion that we must continue to stand up and we must continue to follow the dictates of our conscience, even if that means breaking unjust laws. In 1968, King and the SCLC organized the Poor People's Campaign to address issues of economic justice and injustice. King traveled the country to assemble a multiracial army of the poor that would march on Washington to engage in nonviolent civil disobedience at the Capitol until Congress created an economic bill of rights for poor Americans. On March 29, 1968, King went to Memphis, Tennessee in support of the black sanitary public works employees represented by AFS CME Local 1733 who had been on strike since March 12th for higher wages and better treatment. And safer conditions. In one incident, Black Street repairmen received pay for two hours when they were sent home because of bad weather, but white employees were paid for the full day. On April 3, 1968, Martin Luther King addressed a rally and delivered his I've Been to the Mountaintop Address at Mason Temple, the world headquarters of the Church of God in Christ. Now, Martin's flight to Memphis was delayed by a bomb threat against his plane. All we say to America is be true to what you said on paper. If I lived in China or even Russia or any totalitarian country, maybe I could understand some of these illegal injunctions. Maybe I could understand the denial of certain basic First Amendment privileges because they haven't committed themselves to that over there. But somewhere I read of the freedom of assembly. Somewhere I read of the freedom of speech. Somewhere I read of the freedom of press. Somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest far right.
and so just as I say we aren't going to let any dogs or water hoses turn us around, we aren't going to let any injunction turn us around. Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now. Because I've been to the mountaintop. I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to know the night that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Now, King was booked in room 306 at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, owned by Walter Bailey. King and his entourage stayed at room 306 so often that it was known as the King Abernathy Suite. This is a CBS News special report. Dan Rather reporting for CBS News from New York. The Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. was shot to death by an assassin late today as he stood on a balcony in Memphis, Tennessee. Dr. King had planned to lead another civil rights march in Memphis next Monday. According to Jesse Jackson, who was present, King's last words on the balcony before his assassination were spoken to musician Ben Branch, who was scheduled to perform that night at an event King was attending. Ben, make sure you play Take My Hand, Precious Lord, in the meeting tonight and play it real pretty. Martin Luther King was shot by James Earl Ray at 6.01 p.m. April 4, 1968, as he stood on the motel's second floor balcony. The bullet entered through his right cheek, smashing his jaw, then traveled down his spinal cord before lodging in his shoulder. After emergency chest surgery, Martin Luther King died at St. Joseph's Hospital at 7.05 p.m. on April 4, 1968. Remember that disclaimer I put up front about my own opinion? We're told today James Earl Ray killed Martin Luther King Jr. with a single shot fired from his Remington rifle. Another Oswald, in my opinion. There are many more people involved in that, not just this guy. He was commissioned. Just my opinion. On June 8, 1968, two months after King's death, James Earl Ray was arrested at London's Heathrow Airport, attempting to leave the United Kingdom for Brussels on a false Canadian passport. He was helped. Martin Luther King Jr. was an American Baptist minister and activist who was a civil rights leader. 
He's best known for his role in the advancement of civil rights using nonviolent civil disobedience based on his Christian beliefs. On October 14, 1964, Martin Luther King received the Nobel Peace Prize for combating racial inequality through nonviolent resistance. Any man who deserved that prize, he did. In 1968, Martin was planning a national occupation of Washington, D.C. to be called the Poor People's Campaign when he was assassinated on April 4th in Memphis, Tennessee. His death was followed by many riots in many U.S. cities. King was posthumously awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom and the Congressional Gold Medal. Martin Luther King Jr. Day was established as a holiday in numerous cities and states beginning in 1971 and as a U.S. federal holiday in 1986. Hundreds of streets in the United States have been renamed in his honor, and a county in Washington state was also renamed for him. The Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. was dedicated in 2011. Quote, everybody can be great because anybody can serve. You only need a heart full of grace, a soul generated by love. In closing, I just wish you the greatest of holidays and hope that you have a wonderful new year. I got a feeling 21 is gonna be a good year. I'd like to show you the first song that I've ever recorded, along with a video. It's called, I Believe in Father Christmas. They said there'll be snow at Christmas. They said there'll be peace on earth. But instead it just kept on raining. A veil of tears for the virgin birth. I remember one Christmas morning, a winter's light and a distant choir. And the peal of a bell and that Christmas tree smell. And their eyes full of tinsel and fire. They sold me a dream of Christmas. They sold me a silent night And they told me a fairer story Till I believed in the Israelite And I believed in Father Christmas And I looked to the sky with excited eyes Till I woke with the yawn in that first light of dawn And I saw him in through his disguise
I'm John Horrigan. Thank you so much for watching this broadcast on the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King.